Hi everybody, I'm Diana Gomez and I am the attorney coach for your mock trial team. So I want to go over the facts of the case a little bit to help you better understand the fact pattern and bring out some of the bigger issues that I have seen in this case. It's ironic and interesting that every year the, um, when we do this, we they always come up with a really good case. and. In this year, it's almost like this fact pattern mirrors what happened in our country on January 6th when there was an insurrection at the Capitol. I know this was written well before that, but you can watch current news events and have a pretty good idea of the theory of liability for Donald Trump and the other people at the rally who are said to have incited the crowd to storm the Capitol. We have the basic same theory in this case. So what crimes Lee is trying to be convicted of is that he conspired with Remy to commit a burglary to take documents and that he, um, after that crime, was an accessory after the fact in hiding Lee, so Lee could escape justice, basically, um, and that he, by being an aider and a better to a crime, he is also liable for that very same crime. So the way I look at this case, there are really two issues and we want to go over. Um, it's a pretty straightforward fact pattern, and it all boils down to one thing, intent. Because in each of these crimes, there is an element of intent. And intent for the prosecution team, you must prove that Lee intended to do all the things. Not just that they happened and he was kind of a part of it, but that he specifically and intentionally wanted this to happen this way. For the defense, you're going to do just the opposite. Lee had no intent for Remy to do any of these crimes. Lee was just kind of putting this out there and Remy acted on his own without Lee intentionally assisting him or wanting to help him. So that's the first thing to look at when you're looking through the witness statements and the fact pattern. What do I need to show intent of Lee to have Remy do what Remy did and then the intent of Lee afterward to hide Remy? And for the defense, you're going to be looking through the fact pattern so how this was not an intentional act of Lee. Lee had no intent at all for Remy to do what he did. Okay, so we have intent versus independent action. Because if Remy acted independently, this was Remy's idea to go this far, this was all on Remy, Lee is not guilty of anything. If Lee did in fact intend for all this to happen and Remy went and did what he did, then Lee is guilty of all of it. So when we go through this, I want to be very clear. There is no issue Remy committed a burglary. One, he pled guilty to it, but there's no issue. And basically, it doesn't mean you don't get to discuss the elements in your case, because you will, but you just don't spend a lot of time on it. So for burglary, uh, residential burglary, it means you enter a habitable dwelling. So if somebody has a garage, for example, that's not attached to the house, and nobody lives in it, that's a, that is a structure, a building, but it's not a habitable building. building. So habitable means somebody lives there. There's no question about that. So Remy did enter that with the intent to steal something. And he did that. So, but as a prosecution, you have to say, and go through your elements and say that Lee aided and abetted, conspired to have Remy commit a residential burglary. So meaning he wanted Remy to enter the house that Drew lived in and take something that was in Drew's possession. And I don't know how it's gonna go in the trial, but some side or another may try to make a big deal that this wasn't Drew's property, this would belong to the state of California. Don't go down the rabbit hole. Um, because, and maybe for the defense you wanna go down the rabbit hole and we'll get to those issues. but. This was in Drew's house. Drew was in custody and control of his briefcase. It is his property. So uh, for the purposes of our court. So don't go down the rabbit hole. 
So there's no issue of that. Uh, the only issue in this entire case is, again, did Lee have the intent to encourage <laughs> Remy, assist Remy to commit a crime? And even though Remy might have been encouraged by Lee's words, it doesn't mean Lee had the intent to do that. And I know that seems to be a distinction um, that you're, like, you're probably saying, well, if he encouraged him, if he wanted him to do it, why is he not guilty as an aider or bitter? Because you have to intend that Remy do something illegal. It's not just, for example, I like to give an analogies, and one of the things as you're doing your opening statements and your closing statements, it's always good to get an analogy in of how this case is like this very common fact pattern. Because then the judge and the jurors that you are gonna be talking to, the attorney, the, uh, the other people that are gonna be grading your performance, it puts them in into a real life understandable distinction and also makes it look like you understand what's going on. So here's an analogy that I saw on this case. For the, this is better for the defense and I'll get into one for the prosecution. But again, when we're showing intent, because Lee was no doubt through all this Facebook, through all everything he was doing with the Instagram accounts and the Twitter and the chat, private chats, he was riling up his team, right? His team is anti-government or conspiracy theorists and he is riling them up. He wants them to get out there and start a movement, in his words. We were trying to start a movement and that's great. And people can do that. You have a right to do that. I have a right to start a movement to say no more taxes. I have every right under the First Amendment to do that. I have every right to put that on Instagram. I have every right to have Twitter. I have every right to get my people and people like me to meet and to talk about it. None of that is illegal. And that is what Lee was doing. He was actually paid. This was his job. He was making good money at it. And according to his uh, agent, the more he had private chats and more that he made people feel like they were part of him, then the more money he made. So for both sides, the prosecution, you want to use that. This was Lee's moneymaker. He wanted people to be just like him and do his bidding. For the defense, you use that very same evidence and say, he was just trying to drum up a movement. It's no different than prop, you know, trying to repeal Proposition 13 or trying to have cannabis be legal. We have a group, it starts at a, a grassroots level and then it explodes into a movement. It happens, it's part of the American way of life. This is what we are allowed to do under our Constitution and what we do to effectuate change. Nothing illegal about that. But when it becomes illegal is when that person that is leading that group starts to encourage, aid, abet, this is what we have in this case, his followers to do things that are illegal. And he means and intends for them to do things that are illegal. So the analogy, getting to that, is when a coach says, you're in a huddle, it's homecoming game, football, and yay, it started again. And the coach says, come on guys, get out there, knock heads, kill them, right? Firing up the team, let's go, win. And then the team goes out there and they're fired up and they tackle harder. But the coach doesn't intend for them to kill anybody. The coach doesn't intend for them to knock heads because that would be a penalty. So that's just an example of how the defense can say that's all Lee was doing. He was just dwelling. He was just having the groundswell for his movement. He wasn't intending anybody to do anything illegal. On the other hand, the prosecution can use that same thing and wait, but say, hey, this is not just a bunch of high school football players or provincial football players. These were true believers of Lee true believers who wanted to do anything for this movement because they really believed the government was hiding information that was detrimental to their safety. And Lee was helping them and leading them along the way. And Lee knew it. He knew these people were his sheep and they would follow blindly. And that's what Remy was. And Lee, there's, there's evidence in some of these statements that you can glean out that Lee knew that Remy was one of those guys that really liked Lee and would really follow Lee so for the prosecution, that's what you want to play up. This wasn't just somebody that you're group texting on and liking or commenting on one of your posts. This is someone that you knew thought you were the God. You were everything. And so that's the person that you are speaking to. 
So if I say, gee, it sure would be nice if somebody would go in that store and steal those cigarettes, knowing that the person I'm talking to would do anything to get my attention or to get my love or to get my respect, I knew that about him. Of course he's going to go in and get the cigarettes and bring back, here's, here, here's what I got for you. It's like a puppy dog. So that's how the prosecution wants to play it up. And for the defense, you want to play it up by saying, are you kidding me? This is just part of the Twitter world. We have groups, stars have groups. They say we need to go and march on Washington someday. I never intended anybody to march on Washington and go to the Capitol and enter a building and take people hostage. That's not what I meant. I never intended for that to happen. And again, the analogy, which is a, just a very interesting time, is the Capitol insurrection, right? That's what they are saying that the speakers at the rally beforehand knew. They had that group of people who were at the Capitol. We will call them the, uh, you know, the pro-Trumpers, the anti, you know, stop the ballot, the fraud, whatever it is. I'm not getting into politics, but those were the people. And they're saying, well, Trump, he had this rabid following of this cult. It was like a cult. They would do anything he wanted. And of course, when you started to say, do this, do that, even if it's on the surface, you can say, well, I didn't mean it to happen. If you knew those people would do your bidding at a minute's notice and you say something like that, you knew that they would do it. That's pretty much what we're saying here in this case. But we have a little more evidence. Um, for the prosecution, the most damning piece of evidence I think that they have is the text message, the direct text message between Remy and Lee. For the defense, the evidence that they have that's best for them is pretty much everybody's statement because everyone says, well, that's not what Lee wanted and Lee's just that kind of guy. So there's a lot of things to play with. Um, okay, so we're gonna get into an analogies. Hyperboil, I want you to look that word up. H-Y-P-E-R-B-O-L-E. -E. Because that's what the defense, your case is all about that. This is hyperboil. Lee is, his speaking, his, what he does is just hyperboil. He just is trying to get his people fired up to go out and make change. And you each have two competing experts that will kind of validate your positions in this case. So that's the basics of the case, right? That's the basic way we're looking at this case. The final thing is the crime, uh, the accessory after the fact. And what that means is I know somebody's committed a crime and then I intentionally, there's that word intent again, I intentionally did something to assist them to escape and I'm paring it down greatly. So this is to me a very diff, this is probably the hardest one to prove in this case because we're gonna have to show that one Lee knew what Remy did and they never really say that. Remy never says that, Lee never says that. Nobody ever says that when Remy and Lee spoke, Remy told Lee what he did, that he committed a crime. So for the prosecution, you're gonna have to use circumstantial evidence. Of course Lee knew what Remy did, of course that Lee knew Remy when it got those documents. They had the briefcase. And for the defense, you're gonna say, that's there's no evidence that he knew, that he knew Remy committed crime. And even if he knew that he was helping Remy escape, he was just giving him a place to spend the night because he was so upset. So that's kind of what you're looking at. That's the, from all of these crimes, that's what you are looking at. And for the prosecution, knowing where the defense is going will help you prepare your direct examination, your cross-examination, your opening and your closing. The same thing for the defense. Knowing what the prosecution has to prove will help you to rebut that. Okay, so two last things, uh, and then we'll, I'm gonna go to a different subject. So the prosecution, your main goals. Lee knew exactly what he was doing. Lee knew what his words would mean to people. Lee knew what it would mean to Remy in particular. Um, he knew and intended his words and actions to make Remy do whatever it takes, even enter the house and get what Lee wanted. For the defense, again, hyperboil. Lee was just revving up the team. He never intended anybody to commit a crime, and he certainly never intended anyone to go into somebody's house and knock them down to take a briefcase. That's what you are looking at in this case. So um, it's a fun issue, 
I think you have a lot of things in current affairs right now that you can maybe read about and kind of understand a little bit. Because again, there's going to be pros and cons. You're going to have those that say there was, you know, no insurrection, or not insurrection, excuse me, those that say there was no incitement to riot by the president's team, there are going to be those who say there was. And that's what we have. It's that kind of intent. And the last uh, thing that just came to mind is when we're looking at, well, how could Lee be liable for this? Charles Manson, he had a cult. And in that cult, they committed some atrocious crimes in the 60s. And Charles Manson was prosecuted as an aider and a better and a co-conspirator to those crimes. He didn't enter. Sharon Tate, a famous actress at the time, was murdered. He didn't enter those homes, but he was found guilty and sentenced to death, which was later um, when they took away the death penalty and made life, for his intentional acts to encourage these people to do these crimes. They, they didn't want to, uh, he didn't tell them go to Sharon Tate's house and kill Sharon Tate. He rallied his troops. We have to do something big. We need to go and do something and go into a, and send a message. And his troops, his cult, his fanatical following, who he knew would do anything he said to get to be respected by him, to follow him, because that's what a cult does, went out and found a house and they killed people. And Charles Manson was found liable for that. So that is the kind of, and the same law that is in this case. And that's the law that we are looking at to say whether or not Lee is liable for Remy's actions. Did Lee have such a cult-like Svengali, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, sorry, uh, control over Remy and Renry was such a vulnerable person, and Lee knew all of that, that Lee knew and intended his words would have Remy do whatever it takes, including going in the house. And we all know that's what Lee meant. Because he said, if he's not there, just go in and get him. And then for the opposite, you have somebody else said, this wasn't a cult, this was just a gosh darn Twitter, Instagram group. It was a group chat. Nobody intended anyone to do anything. They only met a handful of times and, and at meet and greets. How can my client, how can Lee be liable for somebody taking that to extreme because in their own mind they became fanatical and rabid for their love of Lee. It's like one of those people that are stalkers and you never have any idea how much they love someone until they go into their house and they see all the pictures of them. How did Lee know? He's never met Remy, been to Remy's house. He's had all of his conversations were in the text chat. So that's what we're looking at. All right, on to the witness statements.